Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Dr. Antonio Velarde, who is with the Institute for Food and Agricultural Research and Technology in Spain. Dr. Velarde, how are you today? Fine, and very happy to be here with you. I'm very happy to have you on as well. Um, some of our audience may not be very familiar with you. And before we jump into the topic at hand, would you give a little bit of a background about yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, as you have said, my name is Antonio Velarde. I am a, a veterinarian by education. And after this, I did my PhD in animal welfare, in, in pigs welfare. And, and, and I have a master also in animal welfare of laboratory animals. And after that, I moved to the institute, to, to IRTA, that it is this Institute of Research and Technology in Agrofood, that is based in Catalonia. It's, it's a public research institute in Catalonia, in, in Spain. And we are doing there a research in animal welfare, not only in pigs, but also in other uh, farm animals. Also, our, our topic is farm animals. We, we do research for, I mean, with public funding, but also uh, the idea is to support uh, farmers and transport driver and other companies who, wants, uh, who want to, I mean, to put or to, let's see the, the animal welfare is also a business strategy. Uh, I'm a member also of the of the animal health and animal welfare panel in the European Food Safety Authority. That this is the this is a, an independent body that provides risk assessment to the to the Commission to the European Commission the European Union in uh, some of the the, the legislation. So we provide the scientific. Uh, background that will support the future legislation, in this case, uh, in animal welfare. And I'm also a member of the European um, European Reference Center of Poultry and other uh, small farm animals that this uh, reference center uh, also support the, the, the commission and all the competent authorities all in the different, in the 27 member states of the European Union. Um, for the implementation, we provide uh, scientific and technical support for the implementation of the um, of the legislation for the official controls and other business that they may have. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that introduction. And and I think just through your description of what you're currently doing, the audience might kind of gather that we're going to talk about welfare today. And so I really want to just start with just that term. What does welfare mean to you so when you hear the word welfare what what comes to mind yes yes welfare i mean um, we can consider um, how the animal uh, stay in the in the surrounding i mean how they can they can cope with the different challenges that they may face from birth until slaughter i mean this means on the farm during transport and the slaughtering and from a scientific point of view, I mean, we provide the, 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 the how to assess this welfare scientifically will be the best uh, recommendations to improve this welfare. But I mean, from our side, we don't uh, suggest which level of welfare. I mean, this is more the legislative part uh, the, the, who, who will put the, the, according to the society, to the economical aspect, they will uh, set up the level of welfare. I mean, we provide the knowledge and the background to have this from a scientific point of view. Okay, yeah. And I think that you, you bring up a good point. Um, here in the United States, we do a lot of welfare audits and those can be done by the producer, um, by somebody external or through uh, some of our companies, our third-party external companies who do it from a harvesting perspective so that the, the packer knows exactly where those pigs are coming from and that they have passed certain audits. Um, and I think that's interesting. When we look at audits, what we do is we walk the barn and we, we look for the basics. We look for 
lame animals, sores, um, spacing, and, and those types of things. And so, but when you're talking about welfare, I hear something a little bit different. I hear something more on behavior. And so how do we take the, what we're doing with audits and move that into more of what the animal's actually perceiving? Yes, I mean, behavior, for example, is an important part of the welfare, but it's not all of them. I mean, when you talk about animal welfare, I mean, this is a multidisciplinary uh, element. It's not only one measure. I mean, you have to, to, to assess the different parts or the different elements of the animal welfare. I mean, for example, in the in the European project, we we uh, welfare quality, we tried to identify this criteria these principles of the animal welfare also and we established that there is four main principles that comp that contains the, the animal welfare this is uh, good feeding good housing up uh, good health and appropriate behavior and and you have you need to have measure for all these four principles i mean if the animal is experienced prolonged hunger prolonged thirst they have ease of movement they 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 can they they are healthy and also the behavior normally farmers uh, the three first principles i mean uh, good feeding good housing and good health it's clear for them and sometimes the challenge is to show that appropriate behavior is also an important element of the animal welfare. But the idea to have a comprehensive animal welfare assessment, you, only behavior is not enough. You have also to assess the other aspects of the animal welfare. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think you bring up a good point with the four principles of health, housing, um, feeding, and behavior. So one of the things I, I kind of want to get back to is that behavior. So how do we look at animal-based indicators for welfare? What are some key measurements that we should be looking for? I mean, uh, animals uh, like us are, I mean, at least the animals that, that, that we are producing and, and pigs, they are social animals. Also, also, so many years of domestication, they have, they still have some behavioral needs that has not been disappeared. Also, being in the in in the in the barns or, or somewhere. Also, they still need to have a hierarchy. They need, also need to explore for food. Also, having the food there. Also, they spend a lot of time exploring, doing foraging behavior. Also, these elements uh, should be measured. I mean, the social. I mean, normally we 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 measure positive behavior and also negative behavior. And positive behavior is also important. If the animal is leaking, when they have interaction, they don't fight. And but not only social behavior, the relationship with the human is also important because I mean they they, they are in contact with operators. And they are fair of them. The, 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 that will be decremental also for the for the welfare. Also, the human animal relationship is also an important aspect. And another important aspect is the other behavior that they are doing. As I tell you, the, the exploring behavior, uh, some stereotypes that may be consequence of the inability of the animal to cope with the, the environment. There is also an important aspect to have into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think you bring a, that up as an interesting point, um, particularly the human-animal interaction. That piece is something that when I walk into a production barn, I look for. If I walk down an alleyway, I want to see pigs coming up to the gates trying to, you know, maybe chew on my pants, but just to at least have that interaction. And I always tell people I'm working with, that's the indication that people are getting in the pens and they are really focused on welfare, right? They're they're in the pens, they're walking around with the pigs and they're comfortable. So I think you bring up a very good point that sometimes we forget to think about that when we're maybe doing an audit. You know, we're focused on more of the physical aspects. Do we see impacts of the negative social, the scratches on the body, the tail bites, et cetera, but maybe we don't look at some of the more positive um, interactions that we could see. 
Um, yes, I think I think you are right. I mean, this is a very important point because nowadays the interaction with the animals is less because they have automatic feeders, drinkers. Maybe we go to the barn once or twice a day to see if they are okay. But most of the interaction, they are negative interaction where they are vaccinated or, or where you have to separate. And, and this has not also a negative impact of the animal welfare, but also on economics. I mean, there's a lot of studies showing that animals with fear that it induce chronic stress, they grow less and they produce also less. Also, it's not only the importance of the good human animal relationship is not only important from the animal welfare perspective, but also from economics perspective. Also, spend some time with the animals and just going there in a good mood is also very good for the for the for the animals, and especially for the pigs. They are very curious animals, and and they learn and they know how was the the the, the last interaction with the with the operator, with the people who are working with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that curiosity brings me to a, another question or, or kind of the next step of, of our questions. And and it really comes down to, you know, also that social interaction with each other and some of their other behaviors. But we see it in our barns here in the United States that sometimes we get tail biting. And, uh, of course, that comes with pigs being curious and, and chewing on whatever they might find in their environment. But we also know it can come with stress. And so here in the United States, we tend to dock the tails of the pigs. Um, but you have a different viewpoint that we don't necessarily need to dock those tails. And so I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about tail biting and what we can do to manage that better. Yes, I mean, the, here, here is in some parts, it's very similar. I mean, tail biting is a difficult uh, uh, topic. I mean, and and it's very challenging. I mean, here also the, the legislation say now that there is uh, is is prohibited to 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 tail dog in a routine manner. I mean, in most of the countries they are they are, they are, they are tail routinely because I mean when there's an outbreak of tail biting, it's very also serious and impair animal welfare. But uh, here, what is curious that there are some countries uh, like Sweden or Finland that they have banned a uh, tail docking uh, for a long time, and they don't have really a problem of uh, tail biting. I mean, th this is not a ma major issue. Issue. This means that there should be a way to do it because I mean, in some countries, in some farm, they don't tail dock and they don't have tail biting problems. It's a multifactorial problem. Also, the the main the main uh, factor might be the lack of enrichment material. As I told you, the, the 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 pigs they need to spend many hours, maybe six six hours, uh, exploring. I mean, exploring the the barn, exploring the enrichment material they they have. If they don't have this enrichment material, of this enrichment material is not effective, is not suitable for the routing, for the exploring, they will redirect it, this behavior to other material or other things that they have near. And one of these is the tail of the neighbor. Also, it's not an aggressive behavior. It's an, a behavior that shows you that there is a, a, a behavioral problem. And most of them is the lack of uh, effective or suitable enrichment material. There is other factors like uh, if the nutrition is not is not um, they, they doesn't like the 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 the, the feed or because they have not the, all the nutrients they need they will continue looking for more food and if they don't have this enriching material they will they will they will redirect this I mean if there is some health issue respiratory there might be also a correlation and might be there is some animals also that they are professional tail biters and and they will also um I, I, here we are challenging also this but i think now because there is a way to do and it has been demonstrated in some farm that they can work 
uh, with the entire tails, I think is is a decision in the in the future to be more strict with the with the, the with the tail docking. So that I think that's interesting, and and certainly we have similar conversations here about is it the feed. Is it ventilation in the facility or is the air not correct? Um, but one of the big things we talk about here is stocking density and how stocking density can influence um, tail biting. And so my question back to you is in these groups that are, that are able to leave the tails intact and are not having tail biting issues, where are they stocking those pigs? Can you provide me with a, a stocking density number? I mean... Uh... I mean, a stocking density number is is also very 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 challenging because I mean it's I mean they need they need also enough space uh, to work. I mean, if they cannot work, they cannot explore. Uh, so they need. I mean, what is important is to have enough space and 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 also to have differentiated the what is the the dirty area with the clean area with this uh, enrichment material. But I think you are absolutely right. I mean, reducing the space, I mean, increasing the space allowance per peak, reduce also the the, the, tile, the tile biting. I, I think here now, uh, the current legislation that for sure it will in increase, now is less than one square meter for a slaughter peak. I mean, in the weight of the slaughter peaks. And, and this, this should be increased not only for the for the exploration but also they need a space to rest and the animals when they rest will depend also of the weather conditions when they are hot they 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 lie in lateral position and they will need much more than one meter for sure uh, if you provide two square meter per peaks you will dramatically reduce uh, but this is should not be the only way. If you don't provide effective enriching material, also increasing the space, you may not solve the problem. There is other ventilation, adequate temperature, feeding. I mean, it's not that easy that you change this and you will improve. It's a combination of all of them. And what is important also is uh, to change the the concept of the pharma about tail biting. I mean, they need also training. They need training to identify in an earlier stage when might be an outbreak, not to be too late, to identify if there is an increase of agitation of the animals, uh, to identify if there is a, a biter in the in the group that normally is not the, the highest, the, 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 the first or the second in the hierarchy, Sometimes they are most of the time they are in the middle of the of the ranking, and and to separate them and to do a, a proper management. I mean, um, move from tile, tile biting to to entire pigs need also a, a training and a change of concept for the farmers as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point, and I didn't realize that it was the middle pig in the pen that tends to be the the instigator of the problem. Um, I've, I've been in those pens where 24 of the 25 have been bitten, so you kind of know who who's at fault, but uh, that's interesting. Yeah, so, no, I mean, they, they are not the, the, the highest in the hierarchy because they are, it's not an aggressive behavior normally. When, I mean, when there is food, is when the, the, the animals like us increase the, 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 the hunger. I mean, when you are... You, you, are, you see that they are food, or when you smell food, you increase. I mean, the first, the highest in the hierarchy, they are the first to go to eat. And the others are behind, maybe waiting for the others to finish. But they have an increase in hunger. Also, they start to explore more. And what they may find, maybe sometimes, is the tail for the pig who is eating. Also, and they start to play. I mean, it's not just a bite. The first reaction is play behavior with the tail, but in this case, it arrives a moment that this playing behavior may cause an injuries, and when there is blood, there is, might be another story because then the animals, the pigs, go to to to, to because they like this, this blood. But the starting point 
is not aggressive, it's just a playing behavior, try to substitute this ex effective enrichment material that is lacking. Hmm. That's interesting. So you keep talking about enrichment material, and I, I want to talk about that for a moment because it it's something we've talked about here. Um, being indoor housed, we've tried things like bowling balls, and there's even little toys you can buy that you hang from the ceilings and the pigs can chew on or push around. Um, we've tried, you know, spiral auger lines that we connect to the to the gates. But one of the things I notice, even in our sow population, is I can put those toys in front of them and they may play with them for the first few days. And then just like our children or our pets, they lose interest. And so how do we keep the environment enriched so that the animals don't eventually get bored of whatever we put in the pen with them and, and keep them engaged in better behaviors? Yes, um, and this is a, also a very challenge. I, I have talked always about effective enriching material or suitable because not all the enrich, not all uh, fit. I mean, and when we when we are thinking about which are the best enrichment material, we have to think about what is the function of this material. Also, there is to explore. Normally, animals when they explore is on the floor, on the ground. Also, if you put something hanging. They may go for curiosity, but it's not fulfilling the, the 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 correct behavior. Also, what they are looking is from something that is destructible. They can play and they can change form it. That if this this material have some odor of some smell, or it can be injured. I mean. We have to think about what should be the the function of this material and what is the quality. I mean, balls or chains. I mean, they are very very rigid. I mean, they cannot be deformated. They don't give in any information to the pigs about the smell. I mean, they can. They are not substitutes of this. What they are looking that is for for a food. I mean, the the golden standard of enrichment material is for sure the straw. But the straw, I mean, I agree that it cannot be introduced in all the, 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 the farms, in all the barns, because like in Spain, I mean, most of them, they are a slatted floor. And in the slatted, you may have problems with the, with the manure afterwards. But you may have some tracks where the animal can just try it to take uh, some some straw, and this can be in some place that is not um, slatted, or you may have some some um, some sticks uh, that, that, that can be deformable. Also, there is some, I mean, there is um, a big work, a large work now, trying to find which are the most suitable material. And also what is important is to change, that you have said, this material to stimulate also the curiosity of the of the pigs. That's very good. So for our audience, what I heard, and I'll just re-emphasize this, it should be on the ground, it should be destructible, and it should have an odor or a smell. So something to entice multiple senses as that animal investigates it. I'm going to switch gears on us just a little bit and talk a little bit about welfare during transport. So you, you've mentioned this, but what are some key things that you think about when we talk about animal welfare during transport? I mean, transport transport is a very, uh, I mean, it's a very important part because, I mean, if you compare how long the animals during the, uh, their life they are traveling, it's very short time. I mean, most of the of most of the time they are in the farm, and the transport is really a very a very short part of the of the production chain of the production but i mean what we are doing there is we are moving animals from an environment that is a routine environment in the farm the animals know when will be the where is the food where is the the water who are the 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 partners the friends they know where to go to 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 rest also in this routine if this is a proper barn, they give the animal confidence and they feel safe. And suddenly we change 
all these facts. I mean, we expose the animal from the from the barn that they have been living during the last month to a new environment. I mean, sometimes they go out from the barn and they see the light. They have a different handling from the operator that they are not used to do this. I mean, sometimes they are moved faster than they need. Uh, other temperatures, I mean, they other, they are mixing animals from different uh, pens, uh, so they need to establish the, the, the hierarchy. They go up to the into the truck and the truck starts to move and there is other sensory uh, stimulus. Also because all these factors occur at the same time, the animal has to do a big effort trying to cope with all these stress factors. I mean, if we only expose to one of these, the animal will not have problems to, to, to cover. But the, 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 the peculiarity of the transport is that all these animals, I mean, the animals are exposed to all these factors at the same time. And so this is an accumulative stress. And the animal need to do more efforts to do this. And pigs, they are especially important because you know they don't have a, a good heart. I mean, they 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 have been genetic selected to grow up very quick. Also, they have very muscle mass, and the the, the heart has not increased proportionally. Also, they are big animals that with a, a small heart. That this heart has to supply with nutrients to the to the muscles. Also, and they don't do a lot of exercise. Also, when they when they are asked to do an exercise and to provide to all these muscles and the other organs with a lot of oxygen and, and, and food, sometimes this hair may collapse. And some most of the death that we may arrive, and we, we may see during transport, is due to this, um, I mean, this, this heart attack or, or, or failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting. You're talking about how our animals don't really exercise much, and so when we do move them and we, we subject them to the stress, they don't have necessarily the appropriate blood flow to the necessary organs, and then they, they will stress, and that's how we would end up with our dead-on arrivals at the, the harvest facility. So what recommendations do you have for our handlers as they're working on loading pigs onto a truck or even our transport drivers? Are there any specific recommendations that, that you encourage them to do today? I mean, yes. I mean, there are some recommendations. I mean, we we know that we cannot remove these uh, factors. I mean, because animals to go to the slaughter, they have to be taken out from the barn. They have to go to the, to the, to the, into the lorry. They have to be handling by other people, but we cannot remove this stress factor, but what we can do is, if know which are these factors, to reduce the severity of these factors. I mean, the first recommendation will be that not all animals are fit for transport. Animals, they are severe limb with prolapse. I mean, these animals have more probability to die or to have welfare consequence in the transport. So a good selection of the animals and the assessment for fitness for transport, I think is crucial. And animals that are not fit for transport, not to put in the, into the lorry because they are more vulnerable and they will suffer more and they have more probability to, to die. And also the, 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 to know, we go again to the behavior, to know the behavior of the, of the animals, to know how they move. I mean, uh, pigs, they like to go in groups when they go into the corridor to the to the lorry also to move in small groups not too many animals i mean the the size should of the group should be adequated if the first one stop you can reach to the first one and sometimes the problem is that big groups if you cannot reach to the pig that has a stopping you just will push the last one and the last one will be more stressed because this animal cannot advance forward but it will also experience maybe the, the the pain of the of the operator also this is this is important to have good uh, ramps or lift um, the i mean it will be a a, a recommendation also not, uh, try not to mix animals from different pens this is challenging but i mean if you can maintain the same animals from the pen the barn 
to the pen in the slaughtering, you will reduce a lot the, the fighting and increase also the space allowance in the in the in the truck because there is some uh, some people believe that i mean the animals are better if they are uh, uh, i mean if they are more tight that they cannot i mean that that they can just go to one to the other just to maintain the balance but the, uh, the animals is like us when they are in the bus and it's crowded they 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 they, they, they want to maintain the balance by themselves without touching the animal from the from the neighbors and so this is this is important to to have appropriate um, appropriate space allowance in the in the truck just to reduce uh, or to avoid a slippery floor that the animal can sleep or falls to have a, a good a uh, transport by the motorway without this curve and and also i mean it, it the time the animal will be in the truck it will be a stressed moment and so try to reduce as much as possible the duration of the of the of the transport i mean if the, the animals are going to the slaughtering better to go to the closest slaughter than not to transport for a longer time and and also heat stress is very important for the for the pigs they are very very sensible to to heat stress because they cannot sweat also uh, try to to maintain a proper temperature and humidity in the surrounding to 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 avoid that the animal got heat that this is also an important cause of 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 death at the end so the, the idea is to identify these factors and how you can reduce the severity of these factors to make the, the transport better or more achievable for the animals. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very good. Well, I kind of see that our time is running out here and I probably could talk to you for multiple hours yet on different welfare aspects. And I have a lot of questions too about some things that you know, what, what might be happening in Europe in terms of welfare. And, and that might be another whole podcast at some point. Um, yes. But as we, as we wrap up today, I really want to just take a few moments and ask you some questions that, that we typically ask all of our speakers. Uh, the first one that, that I would like to ask you is, uh, do you have a swine resource that you would recommend to our audience? Yes. Do you mean that uh, any any link or any website that we uh, that I can recommend? I think all this information or all that we have discussed, uh, if I mean, if the audience is more interested in knowing the details, because I mean, it, it has been just a, a short nut, a short nut, some flavor. I mean, they can they can they can go to the EFSA website. All the reports. I mean, it has been recently last last month. It has been published um, a report about animal epic welfare on farm. That it will be the the scientific base for the future legislation. Uh, it will be also published um, uh, uh, the the transport, the welfare on transport of pigs, and also there is the welfare of slaughter, and also the welfare for on farm killing. And all these details and the scientific background of all these um, th these points that we have discussed today, they can find more there. Also, if they are interested about um, the welfare assessment and all these animal-based indicators that we have talked uh, in the beginning of the of the of the of the talk, um, they can go to the to the welfare quality website. And also the the win there was two European projects that the, the aim was to identify uh, animal based measures I mean valid and repeatable animal based measure there is also the animal welfare uh, web page that is um, a welfare uh, from a, a certification in animal welfare for pigs that is based in in mainly in animal based measures perfect. Yes, and, and for the audience who's not familiar with EFSA, that just stands for European Food Safety Authority. And so that would be a website. And so we can work on providing those couple of those links um, in the podcast material for, for people that are interested. And the next question I would like to ask is, what about something that you're reading today that's not related to pigs that, that you think our audience would enjoy? 
Yes, I have a, here the book that is a book about thinking fast and slow. That is um, that is is uh, the author is Daniel uh, Kahneman. That is uh, a winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, and it's a very interesting book because they, he explains the difference between fast thinking and slow thinking. I mean, this happened all every time in our life that we have to to take a decision and sometimes you take it very fast by intuition and other times you have more times and and you do it in a slowly way processing all the all the advantage and 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 disadvantage i mean the last uh, way of thinking the slow thinking is more energy consuming and sometimes our brain is lazy to do this exercise and that the brain tends to go to the fast thinking, but not always is the, 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 the good option, this one. And, and it's very interesting. The author put some examples that are very, very illustrative. I will recommend this book if you have time to read it. That sounds very interesting. The, the last question I have for you is if you can think of somebody in your life that you view as successful, what's a trait that they possess that you think has allowed them to be successful? I have many people in my life that I can have as a mirror to be successful. I mean, a professional, um, the people who, I mean, the, my, prefer, my director of the PhD who teach me and to give this enthusiasm for the animal welfare. And it was a time that the animal welfare was not, I mean, very common or very, very popular in, in the, the, the vet uh, degree. So they put me this, this uh, curiosity to explore this and, and also the family who gave me the, the, the stability, not the professional, but the other. And, and and also the, the the friends that we have enjoyed and also been for a long time friends and maybe we don't see each other very often now. I mean, they are still there being my friends. I mean, I think there are many people. I'm lucky to, to have met a lot of people that I can say they are success. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. Well, again, we do want to thank you for your time today. It was greatly appreciated and I've certainly learned a lot. And for our audience, again, this is just um, a reminder that this is Dr. Antonio Velarde, who is with the uh, IRTA, or the Institute for Food and Agricultural Research and Technology in Spain. Thank you, Dr. Velarde, for your time today. Thank you very much. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven-week-long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.